The Lord bless you, brethren beloved. Welcome to another in our Bible study series. And as you know, we are in the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings, origins, where it all happened. And we have gone through quite a bit over the last couple of weeks. We give God thanks. And we have uh, been, in, especially in this last uh, period, been on the section dealing with uh, the diversity of our brothers and sisters in the human race. We see where some have light colored skins, some have dark colored skins, some have eyes with a particular shape, some have noses uh, that are straight and narrow, others with their noses wider, etc, etc. Some with straight hairs and others with their hair short and a diversity. And many have asked the question just how did we arrive at this kind of diversity and if and when the answers are not forthcoming there are many that tend to lean towards a secular worldview one where it is said and folks are tempted to want to accept it that we evolved and in the process of evolution uh, some evolved a particular way and so they are Caucasians, others by virtue of the same evolution uh, went a another way and so they are African, black skinned Africans and so forth. But we are showing us certainly by virtue of our small look at the whole subject or the, the basics in the subject of genetics we are seeing where God has placed within humankind a uh, genetic diversity so that depending on who we meet with etc etc different features will emerge and we had started the process of looking at and use as an example animals and genetics in animals to show pretty much how the process works and then we would apply it to humankind uh, so we had started that process and we will continue today so that we can just wrap up that little section but certainly we want it to be come very clear in our minds as to why the diversity and at the same time, we want to tie it back to our common ancestry. Now, I want to jump in and have us to, to continue where we left off last week, just to do a little revision before we jump back into it. Uh, but I believe that it is important because where we are going to end up today, and we will close off the section today, but where we are going to end up, we are going to end up with the, the research findings of scientific luminaries um, of our day uh, in the field of genetics and we are going to see some things that they had presented coming out of research that these men had carried out and we are going to, and without preempting it, we, we are going to look at the results that they have and what they have put forth in a paper uh, that was presented to the world in the year 2000 and it shook a lot of the scientific world it um, certainly caused a smile on the face of many in faith-based organizations because it, it somehow corroborated and somehow gave full support to what the Bible has said over from its beginnings and it comes right back to the point that we have made and we have been making that it is important brothers and sisters that we establish our 
world view, our perceptions from the things that are written in the word of God and not merely from men who have written books based on research that they say that they have done. Men can be wrong. There are things that can be overlooked. There are things that can be put aside. But when it comes to the word of God, we have just got to understand that we must take it at face value, take it for what it is, take it for the, the contents that are there, and understand that it is the word of God for us today. And so, towards the end of the presentation, we are going to present to us the findings. Now, as we have been going in this part of Genesis to kind of break down uh, some amount of uh, basic genetics so that we can have an appreciation of the diversity that we see around us in order to present that so that we can understand it. We had to do a little classroom session and don't worry about it. It's just a matter of going back over it a time or two and it will come but pardon the sessions and it is not everybody that is minded to be scientific or you know to be science-based but how it has been presented it is relatively simple. So it doesn't matter what your background is. Just do take the time out to look at it and just to listen and to see how it comes together. You don't have to have a science background to understand these basic and fundamental points. But sorry for the classroom type setting and presentation, but it is important, brothers and sisters, if we are to at least get the grasp of what it is that I'm trying to say so that as we apply it to humankind we will see that it is the very same thing and we will appreciate and we will understand how the diversity came about. It is not rocket science, it has nothing to do with evolution, it is just the fact that God has placed the information inside of our genes and depending on how we mix and meet and where we end up in terms of across the, the land space of earth, then there are certain characteristics that we will bear. And as we go through, we will see it tying together more and more. But at this juncture, I just want to take us back to a particular chart. It is when we started to look into this particular area, we wanted to set a foundation. We wanted to use some scriptures to establish the fundamentals that God made man and woman. It was God that made Adam and Eve. We want to establish that. Based on where we are going to go this evening as we wrap it up, then I just want to take us back to the, this particular point so that we can reaffirm the scriptures and reaffirm the facts that one, God made man and woman, he made Adam and Eve. Two, that we are coming from one common ancestry. The book of Acts speaks about one blood. These are facts that we cannot and must not brush aside because they are scriptures, they are the word of God, and, and, and it is important that we accept it. And even as we accept it and have it riveted in our consciousness, uh, just to look at naturally basics in terms of scientific analysis, we will see that what we have today corroborates and goes right back to what is written in scriptures, which is one of the objectives of looking through the book of Genesis so that we can build our faith and understand that this book indeed is the word of God. It sets out in order and it is not all the chapters that are chronological but nevertheless it sets out in order what happened at the beginning, the fact that God made Adam and Eve, the fact that they were our parents, the fact that they are our common ancestors and of course we went through a series of things since the commencement of this study but at this point given where we are in the study I want to 
pull our attention back to a particular chart that we had shown with some scriptures, basic scriptures, and I just want to rehearse that in our hearing so that we can again be reminded and it be concretized in our subconscious, in our conscious, in our hearts that this is how it happened. This is how it is. And so let me bring up for our review the, this particular chart. And uh, we have said what, that point about having the correct worldview, but we really are focusing on the scriptures. The fact that Adam and Eve was our parents. The fact that, and they were the first human beings, Adam and then Eve, none before. And this is Bible. And there are many views that are out there, brothers and sisters. There are many perspectives that people have because there is a particular view that in the recreation of the heavens and the earth, Adam and Eve was the first. But prior to the recreation, because there is a view that, are, that, that exists that there is a gap between Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 and Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2. And Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2 speaks about Adam and Eve. But Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, talk, they, they, there is a view that says that there was a group that was there before them. And God totally destroyed that particular family of people. Because it says, as you look at the scriptures, and this is what they say, as you look at the scriptures, you find that the earth was already there, and it's just that God separated it from the waters, right? And they said, notice also that the adversary, the serpent, Satan, when Adam and Eve was here, Satan was already here. So it would appear that in the deluge that occurred before and the earth being over flooded with water it was God that totally wiped out a creation that was there before and in that wiping out the demonic forces along with humankind that was there were wiped out and so this all happened between Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 and Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 they call it a gap period and so much happened there and in fact they say that this was the era of the dinosaurs and nobody knows the length of time between Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 and Genesis chapter 2 verse 2 they say it could be millions of years of course it is believed that this particular gap theory emerged uh, because there was an attempt to try to reconcile the Bible with what scientific uh, research was spitting out at the time. They were saying that men evolved over millions of years and that's why the dinosaurs, we don't see them again, they became extinct, but they roamed the earth millions of years ago they were around. And the Bible didn't speak to anything relating to millions of years. When we look at Adam and Eve, we realize that the earth is young, a couple thousand years old. But as we go, uh, looking through the lens of scientists, they are saying it is millions upon millions of years. And so there are Christian groups that because of the scientific findings, they seek to find a way to merge and to reconcile the Bible with the scientific finding. And their attempt is so that the Bible does not seem to a large majority of people to be irre irrelevant and to be basic and, and, and unscientific and all of that. But the Bible, nor God, does not need help from men to try to defend it. If a man wants to reject the word as it is there, then he's going to just reject it and move on. We might try to you know, do what we can to prove the authenticity of the word, but then fine we will do what we can but there will never be folks good enough educated enough to use means and methodologies of trying to prove 
the truth of the Bible and that it is authentic and that it is the word of God, it is going to have to, at the end of the day, brothers and sisters, be accepted by faith. And so these scriptures are here just to jog our minds a bit and remind us that this is what the word of God says as it relates to our four parents, the first man and the first woman, Adam and Eve. The scriptures that relate to the fact that Adam and Eve had sons and daughters. And therefore, as a result, there were the capacity or there was the capacity for folks getting together and therefore for the expansion and the spreading out of humankind on the earth. It is important also that we understand that God wiped out a large, in fact, all the earth and living creatures except for Noah and his family and of course for two of every kind that God had instructed that they placed on the ark. And when the, del the deluge came and they were in the ark protected by the hands of Almighty God, when the dust was settled and the coast was clear and they came out, it was just Noah with his wife and his three sons, Shem, Ham and Japheth, along with their wives, that were of the human race that was left and they became the progenitors of every individual, every tribe and therefore at the end of the day every nation that we now see on the face of the earth. They all go back to Shem, Ham and Japheth and then of course we know that they go back through Noah all the way up to Adam. I'm telling us Bible. And of course, we see in Acts um, 17 that we are from one blood. So what is it that the scripture is saying to us as it relates to Adam and Eve? First Corinthians, and as I said, I'm doing this to, just to remind us and to reinforce in our minds so that as we go to the other parts, because we're going to just wrap up this part this evening and we move on. Coming to the close of the study in Genesis says so much to look at, so many different areas that we can drill and pull up and expand. And, you know, we'll take a look at Melchizedek, God's willing, next week. We'll take a look at one or two other things and just to, some of the things that cause and have folks wondering, we will just jump at them, address a few more, and then we try to wrap up the book of Genesis. So as it relates to Adam and Eve, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 45, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. This is clearly telling us who the first man was. Now, unless the Bible is wrong or unless the writers were not inspired and therefore wrote what is here, there could be none before Adam that was a man and that eventually got wiped out. Otherwise, Adam would not here be described as the first man. And so I'm saying this based on what I said earlier about the gap theory and the view that there was a creation before what we see beyond Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2. We just want to make it clear, certainly from the scriptures, in 1 Corinthians 15 and 45, brothers and sisters, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. And that's Bible. Now Genesis chapter 3 and verse 20, we are talking about Eve. And Adam called his wife's name Eve because... The question is, why? Why am I calling her Eve? And it, the answer is given here, because she was the mother of all living. All right? So here is the mother of all living. She came out of his side, as we know. And he was the first man. She coming out of his side, 
and then became the mother of all living means that she was the first woman. So irrespective of what anybody has to say, they have no scriptures, there is nothing in the Bible to corroborate any claim outside of what is here, that Adam was the first man and Eve is the, called Eve because she was the mother of all living. She was the first woman because Adam being the first man, she was taken from his side and therefore was the first woman. And so let that resonate and marinate our souls and our spirit. This is Bible. Now, Genesis 5 and verse 4 tells us that, And the days of Adam after he had begotten Seth were 800 years and he begat sons and daughters, which is the point that we just made. There were, and no doubt, there were many sons and there were many daughters. And of course, they, a man and a woman would have gotten together and they would have had offspring and offspring and offspring. And you're talking about a period of 800 years. You and I have only lived um, just an average, some 20 odd years, some 80 odd years. Very few are 100 years. And in a hundred years, just look around and you see the amount of expansion, reproductive expansion that can take place in one century. You know how many lives, how many people can be born in one hundred years. Remember now, um, population grows literally, it grows exponentially. And that is important. So let's imagine now, a decade after decade, there, there's exponential growth. What happens in 100 years? Much less to look back at Adam. After he had said he lived 800 years, and as we said, these were healthy men and women. So let's imagine a period of not 100 or 200 or 300 years, but over a period of 800 years, what would have happened in terms of population expansion and this is where men and women having reproduced would have been able to start getting together to execute the plans of God. We then come over to Genesis chapter 9 and we know of the city, we just mentioned it a while ago without going into the scriptures there, we recognize that uh, Noah built the ark and his offspring Shem, Ham and Japheth and their wives and their wives actually went in to the ark. Then there is Genesis chapter um, 11 verses 8 and 9 that is very important again. We wanted us to get there. We wanted us to, to re recall these scriptures because we are going to find as we go into what we're doing, it is important that we always refer back to thee. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city that is Babel. All right? And we are, we are at Genesis 11, 8 to 9. And verse 9 said, Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of the earth. So Remember this, we are going to come back to this. The Lord scattered them. They were removed from one common location where they were building an, uh, the, the, the tower and they were scattered across the face of the earth and the Lord was behind this. So clearly he knows some things that many of us don't. Clearly he is aware of what he's doing because at that time there were no nations. At that time, there was absolutely no nation. And we know, as we go further in Scripture, that the Bible starts to make prophecies and speak about what's going to happen to nations here and nations there. And God himself spoke about the nations of the earth. are going. This is going to happen to them and that is going to happen to them. And yet, at this early part of our existence, there was no nation. So God knew what was coming and he knew that nations would arise. And if they stayed together at Babel, there would not be nations. There would just be one people. 
And so the Bible said, God confounded the language and scattered them. So he knew that nations would emerge out of this one people. No other way, but out of this one people. They would be spread abroad and be the progenitors of the different nations. Brothers and sisters, it is important that we understand and accept that because that is Bible. Then the Bible tells us, as we look at the last scripture on the chart, Acts chapter 17 and verse 26, and have made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bones of their habitation. So before they were nation, God already had determined the times beforehand and knew that a time would come when nations will, would be around. But at the start, there was none. It was just a family of people, one set of folks at one location. But if nations were to come, they would have had to be scattered abroad. They would have had to be different and diverse. God planned for it. And this is how we know, and we said it last week, that God would have placed inside of our genes the information that would be called upon over time to cause the diversity, the genetic diversity that we see right around the world. So make note of these scriptures again and rivet them in our minds. I brought it forward so that we can have it firmly, indelibly imprinted in our minds. So let's go to the next slide now as we just do a quick review of what we did last week and then we go continue right on and wrap up this session. When we spoke, we indicated that in the known universe, we had 10 to the 80th power in terms of atoms. We asked the question, how many atoms were there in the known universe? And it was 10 with about 80 zeros behind it. So that has passed millions, that has passed billions, that has passed trillions. So that's a whole lot of atoms, the number we don't know. And yet, in the known universe, there is 10 to the 80th power in terms of the amount of atoms that are there. And yet now we come to humankind and we ask this particular information. Do you know how much information is in our genes right now? One man, one woman coming together and passing on their genetic information to their offspring. You know how many how much genes is there that one man, a woman, contain the combination of genes? You're talking 10 to the 2017 power. Not 10 to the 80 power now, you know. Because that was the amount of atoms that exist in the known universe. 10 to the 80th power. Compare that to 10 to the 2000 power. 2017 power, it is saying that we have a vast, almost innumerable amount of genetic information in our system, in our genes. It means dark here, long here, short here, medium here, blue eye, yellow eye, brown eye, green eye. It means light skin, dark skin. It means dark as in dark and light as in light and everything in between it means soft here tough here it means long nose broad nose it is all a diverse mix and they are all contained in our genetic makeup brothers and sisters and this is what we are saying how many children could you have without having two with the same combination you have you have a vast reservoir to choose from. So you could have 80 children, 70 sons, like one of the kings of Israel, not counting his daughters, but 70 sons. And call that he had 100 children. And let me tell you, this 100 could be 
totally diverse. They all could be so different. They could have part of mommy, part of daddy, a most of mommy, most of daddy, little bit of mommy, most of daddy, 70% of daddy, 30% of mommy. They could have some things that neither mommy nor daddy you see in them because the gene pool is so wide. One of them can have something with their toe that none of the other hundred children have nothing that mommy or daddy has but you see something with the toe or something with the finger or something with the eye the eye might, one of them might born with cast eyes and this is the diversity that is there and we wanted us to understand that point and so we say god has put that kind of genetic diversity already in the dog kind and that's why you see dog when they mate depending on who they mate with they look different when you look at the elephant kind you see elephant though, though they have the same shape they are different when you look at the cat kind you right it's the cat family you see a lion you see tigers you see all kind and then when you look down the line at the different kind of cats that are there you realize that the genetic diversity was already in those genes in the different family of animals and it is the very same thing with humankind right that vast diverseness is there in our genes and so as we as time goes and mating takes place and depending with who we meet with etc etc you will find notice brothers and sisters that if somebody that we call white mates with somebody that we call black and they have offspring they have healthy children if somebody that is indian mates with somebody that we call black they have healthy children if somebody that is indian mates with somebody that is white they have healthy children if somebody that is from the aborigines which is in australia mate with somebody from north america they have children there is nothing wrong with the different tribes of people because they are all people we came from a common ancestor adam and eve we all emerged so folks you will get the impression uh, that if somebody from the caucasian group meets with somebody from an aboriginal group they're they're, they're not going to have kids because it's two different races and they're no one race the human race and they always, all the time, have normal children. So that nothing is wrong in terms of the build-up of the people, the mental capacity, the reproductive capacity. It is all one people. The difference that we see is in usually skin color, ear texture, eye color, are a number of things. And we're coming to that in terms of why that is so because we started to look at it already but just to understand the basic genetics that you know the you have dominant genes you have recessive genes in men you have dominant genes you have recessive genes in women and when there is that mating when there is that coming together we find that the offspring usually have diverse and varied outlooks in terms of skin or hair or eye or nose or mouth etc etc it is very important that we um, do understand that and that is what we said that is what we said the last time now <clears throat> whenever that is the case and we have the diversity in terms of the genes, big A and little a and big B and the little b and the big C and the little c. After a while, if they are separated, it, see here we have a situation where the big A and the big B is gone to one side of the one part of the earth. And here we have big A and little b. That's another mix of and we are still in the animal kingdom because we are talking about dogs and we have been talking about dogs. They got let us say big A and little b move. See, see the arrow is pointing to some corner of the earth and let us say that group goes there. Let us say big A and big B goes in the other direction. And then look, at, look below. We have little A and little B. That's the common A and common B. They go into another direction. And then we have 
going into an opposite direction, a common A and a big B. These are the different combinations that you have. If, if there's an A and a B, and a big A, little A, big B, little B, big C, little, you can have a variety of combinations. We have gone through that already. And let us say now, as in the case of, let us use a dog. You want to get a certain kind of dog. You can go to where the big A and the big B animals are, those that have that particular genes. And if you separate them and isolate them into one particular area, brothers and sisters, and I'm just using the cursor. Um, so let us say big A, capital A and capital B. Um, and just look at the screen, capital A and capital B. If you look at capital A and capital B, you will see them going into one direction. Capital A and capital B is going in one direction. Right? And let us say they go one corner. Capital A and common B goes in another direction. And we see it for the different combinations. Now, if, as has happened in the animal kingdom, and with dogs, for example, let us say all dogs with a genetic combination of capital A and capital B is removed and taken to one corner of a particular place. And those with genetic combination of capital A and common B is taken to the other side. If you leave capital A and capital B in one place and they meet, they are going to produce children with the genes capital A and capital B as their dominant genes. Because notice that there is no common B, right? Notice that there is no common B in their gene pool. It is just capital A, capital B. So if you now take that and put them into one corner and they start to reproduce, they are only going to reproduce children with these dominant genes. If you take capital A and common B, so follow me now, you know, and they go as the arrow show to another corner of earth, and therefore they are together by themselves. They are unable to mix with any capital A, capital B. They are unable to mix with any common A, common B. They are unable to mix with any common A, capital B. So they are by themselves, capital A, capital B, and capital A, common B. And they've gone into different places. Once they start to mate among themselves, they are going to produce after the dominant genes that they have, which in this case is capital A, capital B, and they are, you know, and, they, and so and so. And of course, there, there are more in, this is just showing you four, but remember when we started out, we discussed A, big A, little A, big B, little B, big C, little C. Of course, there are more. So with the combination that will be there is a whole lot. Remember, we said 10 to the 2017 power. So a whole lot of combination. But those that are dominant, if they are separated and isolated and then they mate among themselves, we find that they will reproduce after uh, their kind and they will look a particular way. Yes? And all of those and will with the with the capital A, capital B as the dominant genes will look a particular way. All of those with the common A, common B um, combination of genes, they will look a particular way and so forth, so forth. So that is exactly how it goes where and with the animal kind. So bear that in mind. And so we will end up with different combinations being dominant in different groups depending on which mate with which. And that is important. So that's why when you look at, for example, dogs, you know that all of these are in the dog family. When they started out at the beginning, before you have the different species, before you have the wide variety, when it all started, you know, the gene pool and what information was in the genes 
were already there from the early times, from way back, early times. But as they moved out, what you find is that sometimes the, cap, the big A and the big B, when they meet by themselves, they produce those that look a particular way. But when a big A and a, and a little A, or a big B and a little C, when they, they start to look different and then one is dominant, another dominant one, what folks have done and with men, for example, and dogs, let us say you have two small A's, right? Two recessive genes. So they are not the dominant genes now, but you remember the big A is dominant, the little A is what they call recessive, or the non-dominant. Let us say a little A and a little B, two non-dominant get together. They are going to lose information. They have no capital A, they have no capital B. So those two have lost information that their parents had. Now let us say that these, these those with the common A and common B combination are taken out of the family and they are placed in St. Thomas. Of course, because of natural makeup, they are going to meet. And when they start to meet, because no capital B is there, no capital A is there, no capital C is there, what is dominating their genes there now is little a and little b. If they mate among themselves, they are going to reproduce offsprings with little a and little b. So all of those dogs are going to look alike. That is how you end up with what you call, for example, a poodle. They, they pull from other dogs and genes that are, and information from the genes that are absent, they use this, when they talk about pure breed, you know, they select those dogs with a certain type of gene, and they mate them with another dog with a certain type of gene. And when they do that, the offspring comes out a certain way. Now, if, yes, if within the poodle family, you keep mating a male poodle with a female poodle, you're going to find that the offspring is always a poodle. They keep looking the same way. If you meet a, a, a German shepherd with a German shepherd, so they have the same kind of dominant genes, you meet the male and the female and they meet, the offspring is going to be just like a German shepherd. So what has happened with men? They have extracted and separated different combination of dogs and they have mated them to get another type of dog and then that other type of dog for example the poodle if you mate poodle with poodle you get a different it, it, similarly you can mate a german shepherd with a any other kind of dog and whatever that species turns out to be it's going to look different from the German Shepherd and the other, but that combination gives you a different look, etc. But if you keep those with the same dominant genes in the same area and leave them and they mate, their offspring is going to look like them. Remember that point because we are going to apply it to humankind. But in the dog world, and we use as an example men taking them out because you know you have people that breed dogs and a certain type of dog mixed with a certain type of dog give you a rottweiler a certain type of dog mixed with another type of dog give you a pit bull and that kind of thing but if you take rottweiler male and breed with rottweiler female you're gonna get the offspring being a rottweiler pure breed but at the start whatever was there would have had all the information in the genes but as they had children you can have some that get some of mommy dominant gene some of daddy gene and vice versa but you can have some that have not none of daddy major gene like the big a little a big b little b big c little c you can have the offspring in terms of combination where you just have big a and little sorry big a and big b alone they would have lost the little a and they would have lost the little b but they just have the genes from parents as b 
big A, big B from mommy. That dog looks a certain way. If you take that dog and take others like him that came from the parents and put them one side to mate, they are going to have offspring that have big A and big B. And that is important for us to understand. And it is as we do this that we will see what happens even in humankind. So all the dogs that we show that you're seeing on the screen, or that you saw on the screen, sorry, earlier on, they all look different, but it's based on just who they mate with, when, where, etc., etc. And over time, the dog breeds that we have today, that we are seeing all around us, many of these were bred by men in places. They're just dog breeders. And this has been happening for the last 300 and odd years. And so we see a lot of species of dogs. We see all kind of dog, bull terrier, Rottweiler, German Shepherd, Doberman. It is just they're taking genes and certain pool and putting them together to get this pure breed dog. And, and notice, you know, you have to take out some information out of the genes and put it one side and use those dogs. So you have some dogs that have no big A or big B. They just have pure little A, little B. You take them one side and you breed them. You have some dogs that just have big A and big B and no recessive, none of the small, you put them one side. You have a couple of them that have B, big A and little A and those breed among themselves, they look a certain way. On a normal circumstance though, they just interbreed and inter and you will have dogs with a whole lot of different looks, some looking alike, some looking different. But if you take out certain types, the big A, big B, and put them one corner. The little A, little B, put them into one corner. When they start to breed, they look alike. And they keep on, so long as they are in that location and they are amongst themselves, they are going to be having offspring looking like them. And that is very, very important. And so I, I want us to, to follow me now as we continue uh, looking. So we look at the next screen. And we see, so this is just showing you from one original group of dogs, you have all of these, all of these brothers and sisters are dogs. All of those are dogs and it is important. So I just made the point uh, just now that we have about three, over 300, uh, exactly 338 breeds of dog over several hundred years as a result of artificial selection. So just imagine what can happen from, nat from the natural process in a few thousand years, you know, in terms of genetic diversity, it is important that we understand that over time, just out there in the wild, you dogs getting together with this one, that one over there, then them go to a particular location and they spread out, you will see dogs looking, having different looks, but they are dogs. Some with long hair, some with short hair, some with their ears big, some with their ears small. And folks are amazed at what they see when they see the large variety of dogs. But when they started out, it was just that the genes that were, or the information that was in the genes were already planted there. So as they mate, you will see come out somewhere along the line somewhere down the bottom and you're going to see some looking totally different from what even the parents started out looking like and it is important that we understand that the genetic build-up in terms of the information is already it was placed there by almighty god both in the dog kind the cat kind the human kind it was there at the beginning and so over time as mating takes place and you go to different places, you see folks looking different. So, so much can happen in a short period of time because the genetic diversity already exists and that is important. Now, I want us to take a little look at the, what we have there. Um, you see how easy from two dogs, once they get together, you see how easy 
it is for the dog population to grow. So one dog, the blue dog, let us say he, he and the red dog fell in love and they had children. And then here it is, here are the children. And then each of those children, they had children. And then as you go down the line, you have a whole host of dog, a whole host of dog. They came from these two at the top. And it's kind of animated, don't worry about it. But you have a whole lot of dogs easily over a period of time that is coming from these two. I guarantee you, brothers and sisters, I guarantee you, saints, that as the family expands over a long time, you're going to find in that pool of offspring many that don't even look like blue and red up top. You're going to find that they have, as the, the, the more it starts to spread out, the more there starts to be reproduction, the more children are having children and others and others come, you're going to find a diverse mix of dogs. And when they go right back to the blue dog at the top and the red dog at the top, where it all started, you are going to see so many of them looking different from mom and dad that is at the top. And that is exactly what happens once we understand and appreciate that that gene pool is totally, totally, totally massive. Then we must appreciate that the offspring and the further down you go and the more it there is multiplication and the more time goes and they go into other areas and others start to mate with others and mix with others, you are going to see a diverse looking set of dogs. But it comes all the way back up to mom and dad at the top, the red and the blue dog. And you are going to see that the offspring might in many cases look totally different from them. So it is important to understand that. And here is what I am going to use as an illustration. So let me go slowly with this um, to show us something, brothers and sisters. So here we find that loving dog couple again. And let us say that both parents have a SG gene and a L gene. Right? Let us, S and L together, those two together, gives you a medium here. All right? So we're just defining something now. So the blue dog has a S gene and S, the S gene stands for short here. Right? Let us say that S gene means short here. But he also has a L gene, which stands for long here. All right? Let us look at his mother now, the red dog. She also has a S gene and a L gene. Now, when you have the S and the L together, both in mom and dad, the S and the L together gives medium ear here, all right? So if you notice, both dad and mom, the blue dog, and the red dog, they just look average, normal, medium here. The S gene, as I said, stands for short here. And the L gene stands for long here. Very important. Now, when we combine, let us say they have, you know, they are in love, as you noticed there, and they're married, no doubt, and they have children they have a possible combination of an S and a S, because you can have that, remember, no, you know, it's mommy, mommy and daddy have S gene and L gene, both of them. So you can have a number of possible combinations. We have gone through that already. So let us say the first offspring has two S gene, S gene from dad and an S gene from mom. He has two S gene. It means... This baby, this first child, is going to be an offspring with short hair. 
All right, so let us say they have another child, and this child has a S and a L gene. This child is going to be just like mom and dad, and he's going to have medium here. But then there's another combination. They could have the third child, and this child have two L genes, a L and a L. You know what that mean? It means this dog is going to have long hair. So here is a situation in this dog family where mom and dad, who both have S and L genes, come together. And they have three children. One has two S genes they got from the parents. One has a S and a L gene they got from the parents. And one has two Two L gene also got from the parents. Brothers and sisters, you know what is happening here? We have three offsprings, and each of them look different. That is significant, and I want us to understand that. It is the same mother and the same father, but just based on which gene combined with which with which you can have one that has two L genes and so from the same mother and same father the dog is born and have a whole heap of hair long hair and his brother has medium hair and the other one the other child has short hair and they got all of that information from their parents. It's just that when at birth, depending on which gene combined with which, they have either long hair or medium hair or short hair, but it's from the same parents. But not only that, you notice what happened with dogs or cats, animals, certain type of animals. One can be brown, one can have light brown complexion, one could be black. They could have two colors, black and white. Because not only is the hair length a part of the information that comes from the parents, the color that the offspring has in terms of the, we're talking about dogs, you could have one brown and white and one black and white. Have you ever seen a litter of puppies? And when you look in the, you see different colors, the same mother. And <clears throat> so you could have variation of colors, but in terms of the dominant genes, two L genes, the dog have long hair. Two S genes, and, and when I say the dog, I'm talking the offspring. Two S genes, the offspring have short hair. Or a S and a L, the offspring have medium length here, brothers and sisters. This is a, a basic, a fundamental point, and it is important that we understand what we are saying is that based or depending on the combination, who mates with who, and then the combination of genes that is sent to that offspring to come that offspring from the same parents can look different from the others. And the point I was making earlier on now, let us say mom and dad have a fourth child. And that child is this, this one that we looked at earlier on. She was a girl. Long hair, but she was a girl. Let us say mom and dad has a fourth child and that child also has two L genes and is a boy. You're going to have a boy now with two L genes. When he's born, he's going to have long hair like his sister. Those are the genes that are dominant and that are dear. You know what can happen? Those two, if they're separated and isolated, when they get on heat and they have children, because they have taken the, the two with L genes, L and L, and in sister with L and L, 
if you put those to meet, you are going to have the offspring coming out with long hair like them. Because you have separated them, you have isolated them, and you have allowed those genes that are dominant there to be mating among themselves. The offspring are always going to be long hair dogs. Similarly, if you take the two with short, let us say there's another child, a fifth, and that child is another S and S, two S genes, short hair. If that boy and his sister, the first child, is taken out, separated, and then isolated, put over a place, and they meet, both of them have the S genes. They have taken away the L gene from them. When they meet, they are not going to have offspring with L genes any at all because it is not in their genes. They have been now isolated, separated. When they meet, their offspring is going to only have the S genes. So they are going to look just like them with short hair. But is brother and sister same way coming from the same mother and father? The mother and father had all the information. They had S and they had L. The offspring, however, might not have all the information. They can have L and L and no S. So they don't have all the information that the parents have. They can have S and S and no L. And so if those are taken and put aside and they meet, we will have a situation where you can just have one set along here group because they are isolated and they're in this particular area and they mate among themselves all the offspring have long hair here is another set if they mate among themselves which is the short hair ones the s and the s uh, gene and they mate among themselves you could have all those offspring having short hair they're isolated and so they're mating among themselves and they're just looking like each other and of course you will have different variations because you can have the, 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 the S and the L and, the, and then you can have a situation where some of the S and the L meet with some of the L and the L and they look different and then they go to a particular place. I just want us to understand the concept and that is very, very, very important. Now I want us to look at the next screen as we move on. So you would have gotten the point and you would have seen clearly what can easily happen when we have that particular combination. Now imagine some of those dogs go towards a cold climate, brothers and sisters. So we're going further now. They go towards a cold climate. Look what is going to happen. Those with short and medium hair gets cold and they start freezing and they start can't deal with the cold. Guess what is happening to them? There are certain climatic conditions that if you have short hair, because you know in animals, the hair tend to be a kind of protection for them. Either it's protecting you from one kind of climatic condition, one kind of element or the other. So you have in terms of the weather conditions, some conditions that are so cold that some folks die over time if they are constantly in that kind of cold condition or hot condition, whichever. Now let us say, and this is now we are going to talk about something that is called adaptation or natural selection. And these are real terminologies. These have nothing to do with evolution. This is the reality of life brothers and sisters. So imagine some of those dogs go to a, a very cold area because the earth is like that. Some cold, some hot, some in between. There are different elements that are there that we have to contend with. Imagine some of those dogs go towards a cold climate. Those with short hair and medium hair go have a problem because if the time is very cold and you are naked, so to speak, you, are, you can easily become ill and die and this is the process of what they call selection natural selection where some people just can't survive in a certain environment 
Now, let us say those with short hair and medium hair get cold and, and, and die. You are left with dogs with L genes only who on their own, as I said a while ago, right, produces dogs with only N genes. Now, when I say L gene, you know what it means? Those with long hair. Now, guess what is going to happen? Some of them, as I said, with short hair and some of them with long hair, they're all going to the cold place. But guess who going to survive in the cold area? The dogs with the long hair. Because that long hair acts as like you put on a winter coat for them. And they are able to deal with the cold condition because they have long hair. Those with the short hair and the medium hair might find it difficult. So many will die out, but the ones with the long hair will survive in those cold climatic conditions and, and, and continue. And they will continue to reproduce. And, but guess what's going to happen? They are only going to be reproducing among themselves, those with the long hair. So you're going to find their offspring always have long hair and they settle in that cold environment. And so those in the cold environment are those with the long hair and they can deal with the cold because of the long hair that they have. But there is another story. There are those who would go to the hot climates. But there's a, the reverse is going to be true now. Those with the long hair, when they go into some climate, some area where the temperature is, is 100 and odd degrees and them have that long hair, guess what's going to happen to them? They are going to overheat. They can't survive in that condition and they are going to die. So we are now left with dogs with the S genes, the short hair. And because their hair is short, the time is hot, they are able to breathe much better. They are able to cool much better. And they will survive in the hot climate. And guess what? Those with the long hair who can't survive, they are going to die out. So guess what is happening now? We are having a separation. We are having a kind of isolation. So that those with the long hair, that acts as a kind of cloak for them, surviving the cold and those with the short hair is almost like they have on clothes but very thin clothes they are able to survive in the heat and so we start to see how easy the climatic condition and our basic state in terms of who those dogs are the long hair ones survive in the cold temperature the short hair ones survive in the at temperature and they are going to reproduce among themselves the s will reproduce with the s because they are the only ones that were able to survive in that extremely hot temperature and the l is going to reproduce with the l among themselves because they are able to survive in that cold and of course there will be variation of the temperature and different sets will go to different places and you will find that they can survive there. But guess what? Those in the cold look different from those in the heat. Their hair is longer. Yes. That is those in the cold. Their hair is longer. Those in the heat when we see them, their hair is shorter because they are able to adapt in that climatic condition and they survive. And so when you look across, you are, you are going to see something more. Look at, it, look at the, the picture that I, the next slide, basically outlines what I'm saying. So here it is that the long-haired dogs, they go up to the cold climate. They survive there. The short ear dog, you find that they are able to survive in the, 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 the hot climate. And of course, of course, you have dogs going in different directions. And depending on who mate with who, as we said before, they have here probably medium, etc., etc. And they are at a place where the temperature might be such that it works with their um 
here texture etc etc this is what happens with in the dog arena that we have been looking at and brothers and sisters we now apply the principles to human it is the same thing we apply the in the, 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 the principles to humankind so we will find that some folks in terms of their skin are light brown what we call white you will find that some are dark brown what we call black you will find that some are in between they, they we give different names you know we call some red and some yellow nobody's really yellow and so forth but we just make it up to, 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 to match up a certain people, right? If I was to, if I'm telling you that there really is not a real white man, because if you're talking about, if you're talking about a white man or a black man, you want to say a white man, if you say a real white man, so we are just shades of brown, right? If, look at this paper, this is a white, if you see a man looking like this, this is white, you know, you know. So if you see a man looking like this, you know that you either seen a ghost or, or that man is very sick. He's really not white. We call him white, but he don't look like this. This is white. And you say we are black people. And I take it that you kind of know what you're talking about. But if you really, this is not even black, but if you really want to say, if you say this is blue, but I'll have to use this for black for the time being. You don't really see anybody looking like this. Yeah. Uh, you don't really see the body looking like this, right? This is, <laughs> this is black. And if you, see some, if you see somebody like this with two white eyes, and let us say you see them one night, uh, you probably wouldn't see them. You probably would just see the eyes. But this is what a black man looks like. And, and my friend, he, my dear friend, Brother Onir, I used to laugh and we used to make joke because he said that, He's black and he loves this thing, but he wasn't black. He was really dark brown. And you have a few like him in his complexion, uh, even a little darker. You're not black. This is black. This is white. But we are all shades of brown. Light, light brown. In between brown. Dark chocolate brown. I have had chocolate that they say is, I don't remember the name, midnight chocolate or deep chocolate or something like that. Is really a shade of brown. It looks very dark, though, you know. You, you would probably want to say black, black chocolate, but it's really brown. And so we really don't have any black or white people, but we use the term and so forth. But notice and understand that where humankind is concerned, the principle applies the same. In the gene pool that God placed inside of our first parents, right are a whole lot of stuff and i'm going to show something now that hit the world in the year 2000 and it it, it mixed up it mesmerized it it discombobulated the mindset even of a whole lot of those folks who said that they were scientists and they were trying to show that you know, the, the, the white race evolves differently from the black race and the black race came from ape and as they were going through the process of evolution and metamorphosized into other more um, human-like creatures until they reached man that was how man came or the black men came and if you notice that when you go to a certain place if there's racial prejudice you know they they they'll take out a banana and give to a black man because they actually say that he came from the gorilla from apes but white is evolution was different and and other races their evolution was different what they would then indicate is that they all came from different sources, but that is not so. The Bible scriptures, and that's why I started out, or why I started earlier on, for us to understand that we came from a common ancestor, and that the first man, there was one man that was there at first, and there was one woman that was there at first. And it is very important that we understand that and have that riveted in our minds. After the flood after judgment there were only noah and his three sons and their wives nobody else so that what we have today on the earth 
all came from a small group of people and then they spread out. It is in that same way that we are going to have that kind of spreading out in the human family. Remember, we were talking about dogs before, and at a point it is men that cause the separation and the isolation of dogs, and then you start to see when you have that kind of separation and isolation, you kind of started to see um, the different animals mating, and there is uh, some that started to look differently because this one mate with this one, this one that had us. Uh, recessive genes that lost some of what their parents had. They mated among their little kind and two little A's mated. And when you have a male little A and a female little A and they mate, them look a certain way different from when you have a, a L and a L and that kind of thing like we spoke about before. So depending on who mate with who and when and where and how it mix and who, they are going to look different. Now, what are the differences that we can physically see in terms of information that is already in the gene of these animals? The difference that you can see, which is the same in humans, the difference that you can see is difference in the pigmentation. Because based on your genes, you can end up with more um, pigmentation than your brother. So you can be in one household and one child is light skin and one child is dark skin from the same parents. You can live in one household and one child is tall and the other is short. You can be in, in a household from the same parents and one child <coughs> One child has long fingers and another has short fingers. And we can see so many different things. So we can have the variation in color. We can have the variation, I said it last week with my own father in his family. The same mother, same father, but one sister out of all the others, all of them were brown skin and one was dark. And yet the one that was dark, her hair was the longest and it was flowing right past her, her, her bottom. And she was dark but had long flowy hair. And all of her other sisters, they were light brown from the same mother and the same father. And it was almost 10 of them, boys and girls together. And that is just how it is. And both mother and father were brown skinned people. Yet, relatively, yet some of the kids were born dark skinned. Same mother, same father. We have to understand that the more children you have, is the more we are going to see a variation and diversity in different things. Some will have eyes that are cast a certain way. Some will have eyes that are big. Some will have eyes that, you know, recess. They're, they're small and into the skull. So these are physical things that we see once there, are repro when there is reproduction, you know, taking place over and over and more and more you are going to see. So Adam and Eve, Whatever their color were, and we can almost assume it based on genetics, you know, it's just, I won't go into that for now, but they would have had offspring that depending on which gene mixed with which, you're going to have some of them have light skin. Just like the animals that we looked at, we're going to see some of them have long hair, depending on who gets what and who mates with who afterwards. And as time goes on and the more reproduction takes place, is the more you are going to see the differences in the physical things that we look at like color texture eye color nose which is why that and then some of it now will be literally happening not only as the time go on but 
when certain under certain conditions. Now, something happened with the dogs where men separate them, isolate them, and have them to breed amongst each other. And so you have this kind of dog and that kind of dog. The, the uh, what you call the bull terrier, the Rottweiler looking a certain way, the Doberman looking a certain way, um, etc., etc. The poodle looking a certain way, men cause that. And of course, um, by themselves, if a man can do that over 300 years, you know, just imagine what can happen over a thousand years by natural selection. It's the same thing with humankind. So, those that started to, as the breed, as the reproduction takes place and they are having more and more children, something was happening, but guess what? They were together. Can you imagine anything? Can you think of anything, brothers and sisters, in history? that could cause people that were at one place to be separated and to be isolated like what happened with dogs that we spoke about earlier. Men did that with dogs, you know. And of course it happened naturally also where they go and they mate and they spread out because they would just stay one place. They more than anybody else would spread out. But can you think of anything in history that would have caused people who were at one location to just spread out and go on all about, about the place? Yes, you can. The Tower of Babel. Now, if everything that I just said about the animals, the dogs that we were talking about, happened with humankind, you know what's going to happen? The Bible said, and that's why we read those scriptures again when we started this morning, if all of them together, all that genetic diversity is inside of their genes, the information is there, they are all there. God decided that he's going to separate them now and he confounded the language. So here it is that you have families and you have languages. We don't know how God did the language. Uh, when he separated it, no doubt those who were able to understand each other joined themselves in a group. What if those that spoke a certain language, their genes was the L and L genes, similar to what was with the long ear dogs, and they isolated themselves because they are speaking the same language. They have only the L genes, but they speak the same language. So they group up themselves. There is a, they are a family. They understand each other. They are a group. They understand each other. But guess what? They are the L and the L, the two L genes along here. But they are understanding each other. So they group up, they separate, and they isolate. And they're gone. Suppose another set that speak another language understand each other, and they group up. But they are of a particular gene. The pooling is a particular combination. They are going to group up. And they are going to go somewhere. Brothers and sisters, the separation, the dispersion, the isolation is what is responsible for some being in the coal some being in the heat, some being in between, some being far. And it, it is clear that those who understood each other, no doubt families, knowing how God operates, he's not going to take a mother and a father and make the mother understand French and the father understand English. Chances are because he set up the first family. So chances are the family or the close family would have been together. And let us say that amongst those are those with a particular gene set. When they go into the cold area and they survive there, and they are the ones with the L genes, for example, the long hair genes, they are surviving in the cold because they have the build up or the built, the long hair, and whatever is in the skin 
to survive under those harsh, cold conditions. Before we have people looking like how oh, they look now. You used to have the Vikings, and they're here long. They, I mean, people cut them here now, but the hair is normally long. And, and their the skin, although they might be brown skin, but the time is cold, and that cold condition helps the skin to stay that way. When you look over into another section, I know I'm just going from both extremes because in between you would have had it differently. We go over into some of the hottest parts of Africa and we find that those folks have short hair and it is short so that they can cool themselves down much easier because of the elements that they face. And so their ears sharp. But let us say they spoke a certain language and they all got together and they, a particular gene set was there. And when they reproduce this gene set over and over, they are reproducing the same S and S gene. And I'm just putting it in a simplistic way, short hair gene. And they are in that section of Africa that is hot and at the same time they can deal with because of the gene combination that naturally select them for that point then you're going to have those with a certain look being in the cold those with a certain look being in the heat those with a certain look being in between because you have the far east you have the mid east and notice that everybody that is in the mid east look alike everybody that is in africa look alike everybody that is in the, the Caucasians look alike. Clearly, there was an isolation of the genes, just like what happened with the dog, so that the poodles look like poodle and the German shepherd look like German shepherd. It's the same thing with the human race. The Caucasians, their gene pool, when they went there, when they start to reproduce, they look, all the offspring are Caucasians. The, our African brothers, when they went and they start to reproduce, their offspring look the same way and they are at different locations dispersed by Almighty God. And they, those look alike that are here, those look alike that are there, those in the different places look alike, they speak the same language. And this was divinely orchestrated when God dispersed them at the Tower of Babel and scattered them across the earth. That is what happened. That is why you have people looking differently. The diversity was in their genes. And as they multiplied, people started to look different. And when God pushed them away from Babel and sell them out, those with a particular set of combinations were together, both your language and family. And we call their tribes and cultural settings. They, they, they developed that over time because they were there. Notice. That when we look at some of these, look in China, look in India, look across Africa, when we look at the stone markings in a lot of the caves, in a lot of the places, although they are far stretched, far spread, there are some things that are always common. You see the Indians make reference to a flood. You see the Chinese make reference to a flood. You see all the different tribal groups that all different cultures, and when you look at them today, they all make mention to some things that the Bible spoke about. And when we say, oh, these people know about flood. Why is it that every culture have a flood story? It, it seems different. Check it out. All the cultures that we know across, check it out. They all have a story of a flood and a boat. And we say, well, where did them get this from? Remember, and um, Noah, with Shem, Ham, and Japheth. They were the four parents of all the people who became nations across the earth. Never forget that. And the flood story, no doubt, would have been passed down to Noah's, not just Noah's children, they lived it. But the grandchildren, Noah's grandchildren, yes, Shem, Ham, and Japheth's children, and their children, they would have heard it firsthand from their grandparents and their parents and said, this had happened. So when they were dispersed now at Babel, down the line, and they were dispersed, they all knew the story very well. It's just that now some were French, some were Spanish, some were this, some were that, but the story 
knew no language boundary. The story was the story. So in, over there in China where some went, over there in India where some went, over there in Africa where others went, over there in the Middle East where some went, there is the same story. It's just that, you know, over time it tends to shift in terms of you will lose something or embellish something or something like that. But it is the same story because they are coming from one common place. And that is exactly and essentially how the thing demonstrated itself, brothers and sisters, over time. Now I want us to read together, and it might seem scientific, but I want us to get the basic essence of what it is saying. And as I read through it, I'm going to make one quick read and I will just explain it to us. But this represents research findings, research data, the findings of a study, a research that was done by a prominent scientist, a prominent person in the field of genetics and he did his study and presented to the world and it was posted by the New York Times in August I believe it was August 22 in the year 2000 and I just want to read what it says and I want us to draw some our own conclusion brothers and sisters this man is not a Christian in fact this man is a an atheist but he's not discriminating he's not trying to prove that God didn't do this or God didn't do that or God do it no he was doing his professional work as a, a leader in the area of genetics and also as a scientist doing his research and he came to a particular conclusion but along the way he made some statements and there are so many of a couple others who did similar type things that when you see their conclusions you will recognize that it is tying into the word of god and these are people that are scientific in background they are not trying to prove or disprove god they are just dispassionately doing their work and you will see what we present to you so it's a bit of a paper i've just taken some excerpts and i will just read them to you present it on the screen read them to you and just give you a basic feedback so just listening tune in on the slide now and let us read you what these scientists have presented and so this was written by natalie augier in august 22 the year 2000 and it caused a lot of jaws to drop it caused people to think again. Those in the scientific world were, were, it was like an atomic bomb fell. Those in the Christian world were jumping and saying, we knew it all along that we came from a common ancestor. But this research and the findings that was presented really corroborates a lot of the things that we have said over time in scriptures now here is the here is what is is was written in the i believe it was the new york times scientists have long suspected that the racial categories recognized by society are not reflected on the genetic level in other words what we call white people black people and so forth over the years and we accept it as norm is saying no they are saying no that scientists have they have suspected it before and you'll see as we go on why they have pretty much presented a totally different perspective on race and based on genetics so scientists have long suspected that the racial categories recognized by society are not reflected on the genetic level but the more closely that researchers examine the human genome we're talking about genetics the complement of genetic material encased in the heart of almost every cell of the body 
it is the more most of them are convinced that the standard labels used to distinguish people by race have little or no biological meaning. So that the things that we look at to say this person is from the white race and this person is a person from the Indian race and this person is a person from the black African race and we, 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 we find things to show why they are different. What this paper is saying is that there is no biological difference at the biological level, the human level. There is no such thing as race. Little biologically separates the different peoples of the world that you can call it that they are this race or that race. And this is essentially what these scientists have suspected right um, so the next page is telling oh, one second we're going to give you the next slide as we continue to <clears throat> to read i want us to understand that these folks are not christian people these folks are folks that Generally speaking, we would call atheists, but as I said, they have dispassionately done their work and executed what it is that they had researched, and these are their findings. They say that while it may seem easy to tell at a glance whether a person is Caucasian, which is white, African or Asian, the ease dissolves when one probes beneath the surface or beneath surface characteristics and scan the genome for DNA hallmarks of, of, of race. In other words, while you can look at a black man and a white man, and of course, you know, when I say black man and white, white man, I use, I use them in quotation, just because of how we have always categorized them, just for ease of reference, I continue to use those terms. So they are saying that you can, at a glance, tell if a person is Caucasian or white. You can say this person is black or African. You can say this person is Asian, whether it's India, Indian or Chinese or whatever. You can easily look at them and say, they are this. But what these researchers are saying now, this ease of looking at their color and saying this is a particular group of people, this ease dissolve when you start to go below the surface of their skin color and start to look into their genes to see if there is something that makes this man a white man, different from this man being a black man, different from this man being an Asian, whether a Chinese man and so forth. Something must be there based on what we have always been told that there are different races and there are different things something must be there in the genes that separate the white man from the african from the chinese or from the indians so when they dig below the skin surface the color of the skin and look into the genes for dna hallmarks to, to determine and distinguish between the races guess what is happening brothers and sisters when they go between, they are finding that there is nothing in the genes that separates or distinguish who we call white from black or who we call Asian, whether Chinese or Indian or whatever, from black or from white. So the, 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 what they are saying is that race is really a social concept it is not a scientific one dr venter who is head of the celera genomics corporation in rockville i believe it's in maryland hear what he has said and this is the point that i want us to look at brothers and sisters this is the man who had the research team he said we all evolved Remember, I said, no, no, he's not a Christian. He's a atheist, and he would no doubt believe in evolution. So don't watch that. He said, we all evolved 
in the last 100,000 years from the same small number of tribes that migrated out of Africa and colonized the world. Brothers and sisters, I want to understand what is being said here and what Dr. Venter is putting out to the world when this was released in the year 2000. It caused a lot of shockwaves. He is saying that all that we see today across the world, as we colonize the world, as we, were, as we spread out and take over the different parts of the world, he's saying that all that we are seeing now evolved over the last 100,000 years from the same small number of tribes that migrated out of Africa. Brothers and sisters, Babel is over there in Africa. It was Am that had one of his sons and one of his sons or his grandson was none other. A grandson of Ham was none other than a man that we know as Nimrod, who was the man that the Bible said was a mighty hunter before God and who started to build the Tower of Babel. And I want us to remember that. And all of the generations, all the people that were around Nimrod, centered in Babel, all had their ancestry coming back to three boys, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So it is a small number in terms of groups because a certain amount came from Shem, a certain amount came from Ham, and a certain amount came from Japheth. That is Bible. So here in the year 2000, here Dr. Venter is saying that we all evolved, who we are seeing now today, in the last 100,000 years, from the same small number of tribes that migrated out of Africa. Where did we all migrate from, brothers and sisters? We all came from the same group of people, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And they, as part of the reproduction process, as they were multiplying, they placed themselves and concentrated themselves, brothers and sisters, around Babel. And it was God that came down and dispersed them and caused them to migrate out of Africa, out of that place called Babel, and spread themselves. He used the word colonize. And they were dispersed across the world. They were dispersed across the earth. Brothers and sisters, this is very, very significant. And this is exactly what Acts chapter 17 and verse 26 told us. And as made of one blood, all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. Acts is telling us that. And here a scientist, a renowned scientist, in the 21st century, August 22nd, the year 2000, it was released by the New York Times that we are coming from one small number of tribes that migrated out of Africa and was spread across the world, colonized the world, this is what he surmised based on his studies as a scientist in the field of genetics. Brothers and sisters, we are not making of th things. These are facts. These are men outside of the Bible that are presenting their studies. And these studies have taken a long time to come together and he shook up the scientific world. Dr. Venter and scientists are at the National Institute of Health recently 
announced that they had put together a draft of the entire sequence of the human genome. And the researchers have unanimously declared that there is only one race, the human race. Again, Acts chapter 17 and verse 26. And have made of one blood or one race all the nation. That scripture again, we just put it up one more time, you know. I just feel to put it up because this is significant. This is absolutely significant. And of made of one blood, one race, all the nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. Brothers and sisters, we are not saying the Bible is right because of what Dr. Venter said. On the contrary, we are saying, brothers and sisters, that Dr. Venter is right because of what the Bible said. I come back to that point that we made early in our study of Genesis. We must not develop a worldview on the basis of scientific research and then fit the Bible into it. No. We establish our worldview and the things that we accept because of what is in the Bible. And then we try, if it can be done, fit the scientific views and perspectives into the Bible because the Word of God takes precedence and always must. And we must ensure that it is the Bible that we use. And so, Dr. Venter and his team, in their expert analysis, research, and then their submission, have outlined that what we see today came out of what he called evolution over the last 100,000 years. But we know it's not evolution. We know it is that God made the first man, and that's why we read the scripture at the start of tonight's study. The first man, Adam, Eve, because she was the mother of all the living, so therefore the first woman, and they were made by Almighty God. And it is from that common ancestry that we had an explosion coming out of Africa that spread out and colonized, in the words of Dr. Venter, the whole world. Through Adam and Eve, we eventually had Noah. And Noah, through his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, all the nations were established and set up and spread across the world because of God's intervention at Babel in Babylon. And from there, they spread across the earth, just like it was said in the book of Acts chapter 17. Bible is always right. And this, this news that was presented by Dr. Venter and was put to the world through the New York Times shook the scientific world. But those that were in the church recognized all along that this was what was so. We might not be able to prove it scientifically, but we know it because by faith we receive it. It is in the word of God. And these are the things that help us to solidify in our minds that Genesis is a book that was inspired by God and it validates and verifies that God is the creator and we must accept it. May our faith be lifted and be stronger for this research that is saying simply that the Bible is correct. This is word. So we go back to the screen to read the rest of uh, what Dr. Venter and his team might have said. Now, Dr. Venter and other researchers say that those traits most commonly used to distinguish one race from another 
Listen to this. Like skin and eye color are the width of the nose or traits controlled by a relatively are traits controlled by a relatively few number of genes and thus have been able to change rapidly in response to extreme environmental pressures brothers and sisters that's exactly what i said just now when we were speaking earlier on environmental conditions the cold or the heat one certain combination take place during mating and a certain group comes and let us say just like in the dog analogy or the dog um what we use as a, as examples earlier on you can have gene combination resulting in long hair and if those long hair people go to cold to warm climate they are not going to make it they die out and if the people with short hair go to cold climates, they're not going to make it. They're dying out. And that would have been what was happening then. So that the longer hair people were the ones settling in the cold environmental conditions. And the one with the shorter hair, no doubt, because we see them there in Africa, with the, with the shorter hair and the environmental conditions being such that they are able to adapt to that. And basically, it is these things that he's saying the skin color and the eye color which comes about as a result of environmental pressures environmental conditions and so even the skin being lighter in color in certain areas it has a lot to do with what is imposed on us by virtue of the environment so we will have the need for less pigmentation in certain areas as opposed to other areas that have need for more pigmentation more melanin in the skin in some areas less melanin in the skin in other areas and so the skin colors will change and vary depending on the environmental conditions the area in which we settled and this is what he's saying is that is a few the researchers say that those traits more commonly used to distinguish one race from another like the skin the eye color the width of the nose are traits controlled by a relatively few number of genes small, small small and we have so much in terms of our genetics and it's just a few of them control those things the nose and the eye color and the skin color it means that those things are insignificant the things that we make a big fuss about in terms of what we see with the natural eyes like the skin color and the eye shape and the nose and that is a few genes control those and the environmental pressures that we have to deal with and that we have to live under those are the things the genes and the environment that cause men to have complexions differing from others here uh, textures differing from others and this is what the researchers have found and that is what we were saying before so it is important brothers and sisters to understand that and these this is this is literally um, research this is literally writings and research findings that have been presented to us by men and women in the scientific arena they have come about and have right across the board confirmed what we have been saying from the bible brothers and sisters genesis is true and if this presentation can present this to us if this presentation can concretize and validate the things that we were saying all along and to support it studies now from renowned scientific luminaries in the field of genetics supporting what the bible has put out 
then I humbly submit that we hold on to our Bibles and we hold on to Genesis and we understand that if what he's saying is so, then Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. It is being supported by what we have looked at over the past few weeks and it is being supported by scientists who have nothing to do with a God consciousness per se and have dispassionately applied scientific principles to their research and studies and have come up with the conclusion that there are no many races. It's one race. It is the human race. And therefore, through one race, we are where we are today with the different nations corroborating and supporting what Acts chapter 17 has said. I rest my case, brothers and sisters. I, I, I say to us that whether it is the dinosaurs that they at some point we try to use to say we are archaic and we don't even recognize uh, dinosaurs being a part of the world because we have not seen them in the Bible. Well, we showed that these large mammoth creatures are in the Bible and we have shown that the flood is real and although we have different people in terms of their look and diversity in look and speech it is all coming from one central common place our common ancestors and we are submitting and signaling again that Genesis is real you can hold firmly to what is outlined in it every chapter every verse every line and it is a book that sets the pace and sets the tone for everything else that comes in the Bible we must stop it here for this evening and we say God richly bless you and we thank you for joining us another time in Bible study. Take time and go through these notes and let it solidify in your mind and in your system and be sure to reinforce in yourself that the word of God starting in Genesis, it is true, it is faithful. You can read it, you can believe it, you can accept it, you can live it, you can declare it and don't shun away from it in any way possible. Don't, don't move any at all from the things that are written in the Bible. It is the word of Almighty God. God richly bless you. Before we pray, I just want to remind us that comes the 26th, um, which is not Sunday here, but the other Sunday, we will be having communion. I want to use this opportunity just to throw it out there and I want us to spread the, this word around. This coming Sunday, which is Father's Day, and the following Sunday, which is the 26th when we are going to have communion, we are going to try and see what happens if we can put both services into one. Uh, I know it's going to be difficult because of the numbers, but uh, we know Father's Day and Mother's Day, folks normally take some time out because by afternoon you're, you're carrying daddies to dinner. I, I have a dinner to go. I know many fathers have dinner to go. And, you know, folks would have been uh, feeling that if, they have a second service, they may skip it and so forth. It happened at Mother's Day and we quite understand. And you know, we're a family church and we normally organize for eventuality like these. So we want to use this coming Sunday, which is Father's Day. And instead of having two services, we are going to combine them. We are going to do our best and combine them. So we are saying to all our brethren, Get the word out. We will start at 9 o'clock, which is the time when we would start the first service. So we're going to have one service, and it's going to be at 9 o'clock.
for this coming Sunday. Really, I should have announced it Sunday past because we have more viewership at that time. But please spread the word around. I will ask Sister uh, Tisha and her team to send it out um, via social media, telephone, anything that we need to do so that the word is going around over the next couple of days so that we don't have folks coming in for a second service on Sunday. One service and it begins at 9. And the following week, we are going to do the same thing. I will be speaking to um, our ushers. I will be speaking to Brother Gary and see if we, we, we will have chairs enough to go take up all the space going down to where the talk shop is uh, so that if everybody decides that they are going to come out, we will be able to hold as many as possible. If folks will have to stand, we will see, we will see how to judge it. And depending on what happened this Sunday and next Sunday, it could set the pace for us to make some adjustments in our uh, worship time and togetherness and program. So this Sunday, Father's Day, and the following Sunday, which is the 26th, which is communion, we will have one service beginning at 9. And we, because we want to see how the hall holds us, we are going to ask as many of us as can, please, to come out so that we can feel it out and we can make some decisions after that. The Lord richly, richly bless you. And just to let the young ladies, the youth, and this is not men and ladies now, but this is the young ladies, our young ladies, because we have something specially planned for you. We spoke about it already, and by now the word has gone out. We know exams was up to the 11th when we should have gone. Folks were still having exams. We want to ask the parents to please allow them. We are going to have some of our leaders, both men and ladies, in terms of leadership, to be out and we are going to really, really sit and have uh, a session with our ladies, our, our youngsters. And when I say ladies, you know, I'm just talking about our young people, say from 30, <laughs> 35 coming down um, to about uh, 15, 14, from teenager, 13, 13 to 35. So not all our ladies, but our youngsters and we want you to be out and depending on how many of us uh, will be available for I think the date is going to be in July by Sunday you will hear we want to hear from you this Sunday in terms of in terms of a commitment if you can and will make it again I ask parents please allow them to it's going to be for their benefit and they will be tremendously blessed and as we meet together and go through a couple of things relevant to the times and relevant to our young ladies amen in particular so god bless you come on sunday with an indication that you are willing to go and based on that, we will know what kind of transportation to have in place for you because we want you to go wherever we are going. We want you, young ladies, to go down in style, fine style. So we just need to get the numbers, all right? God richly bless you. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Father, again, we come before your awesome presence and we thank you for your mighty works, the mighty things that you have been doing in our lives. Thank you for taking us through another study. Thank you for touching our hearts and our minds. I pray that you will help us to continue to dig into your words, to, to hide your words in our hearts that we will not sin against you, to hide your words to the extent that our faith in you, because of just reading your words and studying your words, mighty God, our faith will grow and grow and grow, and we will be closer drawn to you. Bless your people. Continue to lead and direct and navigate our lives and let your perfect will be done. We give you thanks. We give you glory. We give you praise. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. 
God bless you, brothers and sisters. Thank you again for being in Bible study. God's willing, next week, same time, in the name of the Lord Jesus.